Hi, I'm Dan Olson, and we had another great speaker at Lean Product Meetup tonight, Marty Kagan. He's right back there, product expert and author of Inspired. This is the second edition of his book. You may have read the first edition, or maybe read this one. Tonight, he gave a new talk on product strategy, and so um, we were very excited to hear about that. He shared a lot of great insights and advice. We also had a lot of great Q&A with the audience, so I hope you enjoy it. If you do, please like the video, subscribe to our channel, and uh, also sign up for notifications so you get notified when we publish other videos. Thanks and enjoy. It's good to see everybody, and I am curious how many of you might have been, it's like an annual tradition of Dan and I, I come here each year, but um, I was about this time last year and I gave a talk um, that I wanted to see how many of you might have been here for that. Just quick show of hands, some of you. Uh, the reason I ask is because I um, talked about, I, it was actually a talk that was um, describing what I wanted to work on for the next several years. Uh, just quickly in summary that uh, you know, my book, Inspired, is really about how good product teams solve hard problems in ways customers love but work for the business. And admittedly, that's my favorite thing to do. I love working with teams to do that. That's what most people get into product to do. But I shared last year um, that I've met many teams. I realized I was in a bubble here in Sil Silicon Valley, and I met many teams not only outside of Silicon Valley, in fairness, but also in, right, in San Francisco, that um, they're not allowed to work that way. They're literally not allowed to work the way a good team works. And this, of course, is just insane to me, and I wanted to understand why, and I sort of went on a uh, crusade. I started a multi-year effort. Um, I gave a talk last year which was about empowered. It was about the difference is an empowered product team versus a command and control, also known as a feature team. And I talked a lot about, you know, feature teams are given a roadmap and they just crank out features versus a real product team which is there to solve problems. And I also said that um, I was planning for the next several years to write about what's necessary to actually change into one of these companies, uh, to move from the most kind of company to the best kind of company. And I have, for those that haven't been following um, you know, my blog, I have been writing many articles. My initial focus was on the biggest area I felt was missing, which was coaching. That the managers were not doing their jobs to develop their people, and it, in, for an empowered product team, you really need that. It's a hard job. In fact, I have been increasingly honest and frank with people about the difference between being a product manager on a feature team and a product manager on a true empowered product team. On a feature team, which is what most people sadly are, um, it's really a project manager with a pretty name, pretty title. But it's really a project manager. They are shep if you think about it, what's really going on is there's a little bit of design, and maybe, if you're lucky, a little usability testing, and then code, QA, ship. That's what goes on. So the quote product manager is really there to herd the cats, get everything getting from design into engineering and out. And um, of course, that is not what good companies do, and that is not how they solve problems. And I had talked before about why and you know how good companies work, but I didn't really shine a light on the difference. And so I have been doing that. My series on coaching has been going for months, and um, I finished most of the topics I wanted to write about. I've got a few more. I should mention, Dan and I do share a publisher, and I uh, agreed to another book. So all of these articles are one day wannabe chapters in a book depending on how well they do out with the community. So I share each one and I get feedback and I decide if I can improve it or if I should just scrap the idea or rethink the idea, whatever. But the nice part about that is when I do actually get to the point of a book, I have a lot of data that says this is actually answering real questions. And so I like the process, even though it's some work. Um, now though, I told Dan I have a few other talks and um, I wanted to use this group, which honestly I consider my home group. This is my, you know, this is where I've spent 
40 years. So I love this area, and, I, and of course, a lot of you I've met before and know many of the companies. And I, so I wanted to try out a new topic. I'm going to admit, I actually picked the hardest topic to talk about because uh, this is one, actually, product strategy is what I usually reserve for when I advise a company. Because, and that's pretty much what advisors do, is strategy. Um, there's a little bit on technique and process and stuff, but mostly it's about strategy. That's a lot easier to do one-on-one -on -one with a company than it is to talk in general terms. So, I, but I had to talk, tackle that with the purpose of the book. So, I am trying out a big topic on you. And I'll also warn you that um, this really is a big topic. I'm not exaggerating. We could talk all day on this. And so I kind of, I'm going to plant a lot of seeds with you. Uh, I'm not trying to just tease you or anything. It's just I want to get you to rethink some of the things that are going on in, in probably your company, in many companies. For those that haven't heard me talk, I'm kind of all about the difference between the best companies and the rest. Um, I will admit to, especially in this book, there's four companies that have very heavily influenced me. I went back to these companies. I was really looking at what's different. Those are Amazon, Google, Netflix, Apple. Now, of course, there's other really good companies, Airbnb, Slack, Etsy. We can keep going. Other really good companies. But those four, I'm just sort of confessing that they had a disproportionate impact on me. And partly because they have consistently innovated. They really have, and sort of they've earned their place for me. And the other reason was is because those four companies, if you've been inside those four companies, they have very different cultures. And this is something that kind of makes this whole discussion tough. Because I, I'll admit, I used to say good companies had a strong product culture. Bad companies, IT culture. You've probably heard that. And the truth is, it's more nuanced than that. Uh, for example, all you have to do is go visit Amazon, go visit Google, and they're two completely different planets. They have very different cultures. Yet, you'll see they have very common philosophy when it comes to the topic of empowered product teams. In fact, they share that with, them, with uh, Google and with Netflix. And so I've been spending time untangling what I think is really essential about those four companies from what's just honestly a reflection of their founders. So what I think is really important from what's just sort of incidental. Uh, and admittedly, that's driven a lot by my own judgment of this. But, uh, but that's what I'm sharing with you. It's like those companies do strategy much different and much better than most companies, as an example. They also do coaching much better. And so these are the things I'm talking about. So Dan did a good job giving you my background, so I don't need to uh, repeat that. Uh, what I do is let's start by talking about what I even mean by product strategy. So Empowered product teams are all about giving teams hard problems to solve and also giving them the space to solve them. The Netflix phrases that is give them freedom and give them space to do their thing. And that's really what we're talking about. Now, the real question though here is how does a company decide which problems they should actually work on? That's what we mean by strategy, product strategy. Let's also admit there's market strategy, business strategy, um, sales strategy, every kind of strategy. We are talking product strategy, which is really another way of phrasing it is how do you make the product vision a reality? But this, is, this topic of product strategy is really a critical topic because it's the bridge between your vision and what product teams actually work on. That's what's key. Now, this is one of the most remarkable things to me, but when we talk about most companies rather than the best companies, many of you have probably seen this. It'll just be a fun, I can watch this a hundred times. This is the uh, underpants gnomes. If you don't know the underpants gnomes, you're in for a treat. This is the um, shorter version. Um, if you watch this at work, Turn down the volume. Uh, but uh, 
Anyway, let's show it and then I'll tell you why I relate to it so well. This is where all our work is done. So what are you going to do with all these underpants that you steal? Collecting underpants is just phase one. Phase one, collect underpants. So what's phase two? <laughs> hey, what's phase two? Phase one, we collect underpants. Yeah, 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 but what about phase two? Well, phase three is profit. Get it? I don't get it. You see, phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, phase three, profit. Oh, I get it. <laughs> I cut off some of the more egregious issues, uh, the things they talked about in there. But honestly, um, I know that's, I mean, it's funny, but it's so true. This is so true. I cannot tell you how many companies I meet, they have some big objective. You know, they're pretty much all the same too, like double revenue and reduce our churn rate and all this. So they have all these big, you know, objectives. But, uh, but then all of a sudden, you got a roadmap of a hundred features. It's like what? You know, what is missing from this picture? Strategy is missing from this picture. Now, it's more insidious than that. I, I really do believe I understand the reasons it's missing. Now, fundamentally at one level, the reason it's missing is because it's hard. And companies hate hard things. I mean, I've learned that over the years for sure. They hate hard things. And you know, there are if you go online and Google like product strategy or make the mistake of saying product strategy framework, you will get all kinds of garbage that comes back that tries to give you like a fill in the blank thing. Um, and that, you know, and that's, of course, they're useless. Now, one of the reasons, well, you'll see why, but these things are useless. Um, and also, a lot of people, most companies honestly don't do anything. I'm serious there. They don't do anything. They go right to roadmaps. But some companies like go, we should have a strategy. I mean, <coughs> they talk about that in business school. We should have a strategy. So what do they do? They hire McKinsey or they hire Bain or somebody like that, which they don't realize it, but they're actually giving them a business strategy, not a product strategy. So it's not even really useful to us. But still, they feel like they have a nice PowerPoint presentation now that they can show. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's really, it's really depressing. But if you look at what a real, a good strategy is, there is some talented leader. And honestly, this is a theme I come back to all the time. In the good companies, they have good leaders. This is really the key difference. But they have a talented leader that identifies the few critical issues. And they actually figure out how to get leverage out of what they work on. And then they focus the attention, the action, on things that actually matters. That is so different than what most companies do. Now, what I wanted to drill into is why, well, why don't companies really do this? The fundamental reason is because it's hard. But the um, more specifically, there are four things that have to be done well to do, have a good product strategy. And each of those four things, as you'll see, that you probably know, are difficult <coughs> things for companies to do. If, if it was easy, we wouldn't have this issue. So what I wanted to do is sort of work through these four things, uh, both pointing out what I find in most companies and then trying to show you what I see in good companies. Of course, where we really need more time would be in what do good companies do, and that is why I'm working on a book. So, all right, let's talk about the, uh, the four big things. First of all, they have to be able to focus. That word, most companies are allergic to that word. They really don't understand what focus is. Most of them think it's prioritization. It is not prioritization. But we'll talk about what it really is. But they have to focus on the critical problems. It's one of the true things about business is that not all problems are equal. All right, second, they have to generate insights on how to attack those problems. That's a hard one for uh, most companies. It's the heart. It's the heart of good companies but it's very hard for most companies. 
Third, they actually have to coordinate the actions for each product team. This is, this is literally where a strategy turns into work, turns into actions. And then finally, they have to actively manage. I'm still looking for the right verb there, but it's because um, I do not mean micromanage here. Of course, I do not mean that. But I also don't mean passive management. So many people think that agile teams and, and honestly even they think empowered teams mean back off managers. That is so not true. It's exactly the opposite. So we need to talk about, I say this a lot now, is just we don't need less management, we need better management. So these are the four things and I want to drill into each of them. Let's start with focus. So you guys know, most companies, this is not really a secret how many companies struggle with focus and being able to really choose. And I, I want to be clear what I mean by focus. Uh, I was actually at a company just recently, and, and I, I've seen this on many companies. I wouldn't be surprised if you've seen it at yours. So along some wall somewhere, or at least on some spreadsheet floating around, is a list of the top priority initiatives or whatever you want to call them, the big things, not the little thing. I'm not even talking about little roadmap, <laughs> I'm talking about the big things. And this one company had over 60 of them, <laughs> literally. And those were like, we must do. 60 things we must do. And you know what's funny is I had this conversation with their leaders, I mean like, do you, can we talk about focus? And they're like, oh yeah, that's the prune down list, right? <laughs> We wanted to do much more. We know what it means to sacrifice. <laughs> no, but honestly, I'm going to be real with you. At this level, if you've got more than a few, it's too many. So we have to talk about how people do that. Um, I feel a little guilty about what I'm about to share with you here because I don't know these people personally, but I have been, I, have many, I don't know how many of you have seen a few years ago, uh, uh, an otherwise excellent resource for product people. The first round review, some of you may know they're one of my favorite VCs, first round capital in Philadelphia. Um, they, pub they have a really good blog. But anyway, they published this article talking about the Pandora product priorita prioritization process. Some of you may have seen it. For years, I have been forwarding a link to this to people to say this is exactly what you don't want to do. Seriously, it is exactly, it is the poster child for bad strategy. Well, honestly, it's not even fair to call it a bad strategy. It's no strategy. Because, and for those that don't know, and, I, and it is true, there's this kind of extreme, but it's really very similar in principle to what so many companies do. So what they do is they basically um, imagine sort of the absence of product management or product strategy or product leadership. All they do is they have a certain amount of engineering capacity, which in fairness to them in their case was not very much, which is sort of the root of the issue. But anyway, we all have not as much as we want. So they had some engineering capacity and of course they wanted to try to satisfy as many stakeholders as they could. So the way they do it is they give fake money to each stakeholder proportionate you know, to what the CEO says, you get $20, you get $30, and they can buy whatever features they want. <laughs> That's their process. And of course, they were bragging about it because um, it's like the stakeholders, you know, get to get what they want. This is exactly what I mean by a uh, difference between a product team is there to serve the customers in ways that work for the business versus um, a feature team is there to serve the business. That's exactly what's going on. I didn't know them. I still don't know them. But when I read it, read the article, I was thinking, OK, well, this is what happens when you have zero product. And I was certain, certain that, first of all, I knew they were going to get a ton of features. Because that is, a, that is a recipe for a ton of features. But I also knew there's almost no chance there's going to be innovation. Almost no chance. And that in, in, a, in our tech-powered company, to me, that's just, it's only a matter of time. So I didn't know when it would happen. But it's interesting, right after this article was published, uh, 
if you had watched, they went public, I think, at $16 a share. Just like this. Gradual, wasn't overnight, over years, gradual. At $8 a share, they got sold to, well, to basically for salvage price to Sirius XM, which is, they're dead. <laughs> so that's exactly what you would predict would happen. If this is, you know, at the absence of product strategy, at the absence of product management. So many companies, that, that where these roadmaps are actually coming from is a negotiation with the different lines of business. So it's not really much different. They're just sort of being very overt about it. Now, I want to be a little fair. I, again, I don't know them, but I, I want to be fair. Every time I've seen a system like that, it's not the product people are saying we should do this. They're forced to. Usually it's the CEO or the other leaders are forcing them. And when I also learned in that article <laughs> that they went public, remember Pandora went public, with 40 engineers. Think about that. 40 engineers. Now, of course, as investors, first round is, this is such an awesome company. Only 40 engineers. Look what they've done. I'm thinking, they had no business going public with 40 engineers. Uh, and I think in hindsight it was clear. They were, because they were, uh, obviously these are people competing with Spotify, with Apple, with the serious players, and 40, you, you know, you're not. So in fairness to them, with only 40 engineers, I don't know what they could have done. And the truth is, if I was the head of product, I would have known that the stakeholders, no matter how much funny money we give them, they are not going to be happy. And so this was maybe a way to make as many of them, you know, at least include them in the demise together. <laughs> yeah. But that is, that is a good example of a company with no strategy. Now, what they really were doing, and I don't know if they realized this or not, but they were, com they were confusing, what they were confusing was focus and prioritization. Because what they were really doing was a prioritization process, not a focus process. So I want to talk about focus a little bit because we need to talk about what that really means and why it's so essential. It's just one of those words that's thrown around every single company but is largely meaningless. It really means two things. The first is that only a few things on that 55 or 60 item list will actually have the chance of moving the needle, realistically. Um, Everybody learns this, I think, in, their, in a different way when they learn it. Um, I remember still the time I learned it, and it was because um, it made such an impression on me. I learned this lesson about real impact and focus because, uh, well, like Dan said, I started, started as an engineer, actually very close to here in Palo Alto uh, at HP Labs. And, um, you know, I was right out of university, and I had known, you know, which basically means I knew the theory of you know, programming, but not really much of the practice of it. So one of the nice things that uh, at HP Labs was they had what we would today call pair programming. It's where I, we were paired with somebody, uh, and I was paired with a great guy, actually, who um, was, fortunately for me, answered all my questions and very tolerant. Um, but um, so we were, I was honestly not programming. I was watching him. That's, uh, he was very good. And, but it was an amazing <laughs> education for me. Amazing education. And one of, uh, we were working on system software, pr development tools, development environments, and one of our uh, objectives that we had was performance. And, and it's that kind of software, it's still, like if you go to Apple, performance is still one of those things. But anyway, so I'm, uh, every time we started working on something, um, you know, when I saw code that was obviously not that efficient, I was, his name was Brian, and I said, what about, uh, let's work on that? We could definitely improve that. And he would say, well, we could, but we're not going to. And the next day, the next area, <coughs> we could, we're not going to. He just kept saying that. And honestly, I, all right, 
All right. Anyway, uh, about a month later or so, he says, uh, now we're going to work on performance, finally. And so first thing he does is he brings up the performance analysis tool, which is on basically every operating system. And, uh, and we run it through some paces, the software through some paces. And sure enough, there's an re uh, online report that comes out. And there were three things where all the time was going. And he really wanted me to see this. And he said, here's why I kept saying no before. We could have fixed every one of those issues that I pointed out. And he said, the truth was, even if we did every one of them, the user would not have perceived any difference. Would have made no perceptible difference. However, if we focus on these three areas, we're going to make all the difference. And he said, that's what goes on across the organizations all the time. Everybody's told to work on tech debt, which means nobody really does the hard stuff with tech debt that really has to happen. Or everybody's supposed to work on growth, and nobody really moves the needle on growth. Same with retention, all these things. They don't, everybody does just a little bit, nobody really puts the effort in to make it happen. And it really made an impact on me. That was obviously a software engineering uh, application of this theory, but it, I think it's really true. There's only a few things that really make an impact. The reason that pro Pandora process was so flawed is because it ignored that and it was trying to be politically correct and please as many stakeholders as they could. Not impact. Now there's another dimension too that's just also going on here that makes focus so essential. Because you, you could say, well, just prioritize the things and work on you know, the top priority. But the truth is, especially in organizations, if you try to work on too many things at once, everything slows down. Now, of course, if your team is running Kanban or something, this is one of the fundamental concepts, this idea of WIP limits, work in process. The bottom, the bottom line is if you try to work on a few things at once, you know, you will bottleneck and things slow down. You actually get more throughput if you limit the things. And I absolutely see that play out every day with teams, but the truth is it's even more true and much more dramatic at an organizational level. Because now you're talking about senior leadership's attention and decision making and removing obstacles and that. Now, if you get an organization try to do even 10 of these big things at once, they are just, it's just like the freeways here, you know, too much on there, nobody goes anywhere. It's the same principle. So focus is so critical because you really have to make sure you've only got a few things at a time going through your organization and they need to be the things that really can move the needle. Now, I haven't told you how you pick those things that can move the needle, but the, the honest answer for that is that's where the smart leader comes in. Where they really are studying the data, studying the business, the, uh, the model of the company, and understand those dynamics. All right. But the big takeaway here is prioritization is not focus. You really need your organization to, and this is a primary responsibility of product leadership. You know, working with the CTO, CTO is usually not the problem here. This is more on the head of product. But um, to really understand that we are not talking prioritization, we're talking the top few things, the things that really can move the needle. In fact, I find most organizations, they spend way too much time worried about prioritization. And honestly, this is another talk, but it's not only is a waste of time, it's predicated on things that they don't know. They are guessing about how much money would be made. They're guessing about how hard it would be. They have no clue, though. So it's all guesses anyway. So I try to get organizations to stop focusing on this prioritization concept and instead learn to focus. All right. And you know, part of that is getting very good and fast at trying out ideas. We'll talk about that. All right. Second point I brought up was insights. Insights are actually where 
you know, as an advisor, that's where I spend a lot of time with the teams. Um, now, we'll talk about those, but it's in most companies, actually, this is sort of what I see. I'm staying with my gnome friends there, but the, um, they are literally not interested in the insights. They are not interested in the insights because they are too busy basically trying to satisfy the stakeholders. They're not looking at the insights. They're not, they're just not even, even when they're right in front of their face. If you go in most companies, again, most companies are feature teams, and they do a little, let's say, usability testing on some design. And sometimes they actually learn something pretty interesting. And you go try to tell the head, you know, director of VP product about this insight that you just got about your customers. Okay, what are we going to do with that? It's not really something they're interested. They already have a roadmap for the quarter. Not interested. It's like, where do insights fit in their model? They don't. But this is what's essential. We need to talk about it. Strong companies, insights are everything. So we get insights, and I want to be clear, the truth is insights can come from anywhere. Anywhere, I was actually with one of the, I, I'm a big advocate of uh, Ben Thompson's blog, Stratechery, um, is it, which is really a business strategy, little product strategy, but mostly business strategy blog. But I love his thinking, and um, one of the companies I was with, thanks to him, they got a really good insight from another company in their industry, but a, a really good insight that led to some really good product work that really looks like it's moving the needle. So insights can come from anywhere. I'm not trying to, but there are some major sources of insight. Qualitative insights, I mean, I put them first because in truth, this is my favorite source. Uh, qualitative insights is usually coming from chat conversations with our customers and our users. Uh, and they can be prospective customers. They can, by the way, be former customers. They can even be competitors' customers. It is amazing what you can learn. And it is, uh, I don't think there's a substitute for the face-to-face -face interactions we do with users and customers. You just have to realize when you're doing that, you're not trying to prove anything. You're just trying to learn. But it is amazing what you can learn. And just off the wall, great insights. You know, they're very unpredictable when you do qualitative, but I encourage product teams to, do, to gather qualitative insights every single week. Uh, normally, we do that by uh, trying out our prototypes with customers to see how they respond. But that's really a teeing up of a very high quality conversation about why they wouldn't use this and what it would take to get them to use it. So I adore qualitative insights, and if I had to sort of credit any one source for the best <laughs> progress in product from my experience, it's that. But there is no question there is a close second today, and probably in five years I'll reorder these two, because um, the quantitative insights are phenomenal. Uh, we are talking about insights based on data. Um, with this might be data that we uh, aggregate over time in our data warehouse, trying to better understand our customers. Very often, it's uh, an A-B test that surprises us, and that inspires us to go figure out what is going on, uh, which is often back to the qualitative testing. But they are these quantitative insights are phenomenal, phenomenal, and so many companies today. The, the thing about the quantitative side is. You really need some pretty significant volume of data, but then it just gets better and better and better. So it's, you know, it's not something that's especially useful to most startups and most certainly most B2B, but pretty soon you start to get serious traffic, you start to get some real history here, and you start to get some real insights on the data. And I should also emphasize a lot of the biggest insights are really blends. It's looking at both. Because quantitative might tell us what's actually happening, but it, it generally can't tell us why. So the qualitative can help explain what's going on, and then you have that big aha moment, and then you direct the product organization to really fix that problem, and now we've made a real difference. So that's another great source of uh, insights. Um, and you know, in our industry, this is what I think is great about our industry, is the technology foundation is always changing. 
which means, you know, from a product perspective, the way we think about that is there are things we can do today that we could not do tomorrow. Yesterday, <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> we couldn't do yesterday. Uh, and so that's what we're looking for, right? Things that are just now possible. And, you know, this is by definition a moving target. We are always evaluating new technologies. Now, of course, product people and, and their, our technology counterparts have to use their judgment. You know, some things are fads, some things are real trends. You have to decide, you have to separate the marketing hype from the reality. Um, so uh, it was actually, I've, I've been charmed in my career, so lucky. But when I went uh, and studied computer science, I actually studied artificial intelligence, which if well, if you knew the year I graduated, that would be like, did they even know what that was? It was so, it was like, but back then, that was like the next big thing. And of course, it was not even close to the next big thing. But the funny thing is, there, there was like three more times where it became the next big thing, and it just sort of fizzled out. It wasn't until the last couple years that it's like, you know what, this is not a fad, this is a real thing. Because now there are real solutions that are based on this, it's not just theory. The theory honestly hasn't changed all that much, but now it's practical. And you can use it for real. And of course, there's a big reason for that, which is the volume of data that it's predicated on. But anyway, I love, that's what I, if, if I had to pick one thing that makes me love this industry so much, it's the enabling technology. And that it is always getting better. Um, I, I go to China every year, um, and don't worry, I was not just in China. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a trip I had to cancel, but I, um, I was there well before anything was going on. Um, but uh, it, they're, they're amazing what they've been doing. China is just, uh, I, almost, I, I used to feel like Silicon Valley was pretty much ahead of the world. Not so much. Uh, especially in China is just what they've done. You know, they have three times the market we do in the U.S., three times. Uh, and they also have some of the best teams in the world now. And, um, of course, this, they're a good example of um, the nonlinear value provided by data. When you get more and more data, you start being able to do two things that you could never do before. It, it just becomes much more practical. Instead of a week for a test, day for a test, that kind of thing. So anyway, technology is fabulous. And the last is there are insights in our industry, our market, our competitors. Uh, and that, that would be an example from things like uh, Stratechery. Um, but there's so always, always interesting things to learn in, our, in your industry and from other industries. I love how the enterprise market is learning from the consumer market today and adopting a lot of the practices. But at strong companies, they live for this. This is that dynamic. In strong companies, it's not just a once in a while thing that a designer comes to a, you know, or a product manager says, hey, this week we learned something interesting. This is like what they live for. In fact, a big responsibility of the managers and leaders is to collect this and disseminate these learnings. They are literally there to connect the dots. They are there to connect the dots. So it's not, you know, a lot of people wonder, well, what do I do with this learning? You know, just putting it out on Slack is not, it's not going to go anywhere useful. They, first of all, it needs to be really curated. People have to think about how it fits in with the bigger picture. And then it has to be intentionally disseminated. Like, like if you're a leader and you know this other team over here really should hear about this learning, you're going to go and share that learning or connect them with that team. And if it's a general enough learning, you're going to have like at the weekly or the monthly one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to say, hey, we had some big learnings this week that you need to know about. Those learnings could be any of these things, right? It could be any kind of learning. But they are, they're sort of like a learning distribution machine, these leaders. And I find it so different than the not good companies. It's like they're, the not good companies are not even in this game. They're not even trying. All right. So. Yeah, the core of strategy work is really always the same. Discovering the critical factors, 
these are the insights here, and designing a way of coordinating and focusing the action to deal with those problems, those factors. So that leads us to the next big topic, which I would argue is where it really, this is where the rubber meets the road, if you will, action. We need to turn our insights into action. Now, I have to admit, because in truth, I, I'm now all about the empowered product teams. I have, I'm not spending any time helping anybody to become a better feature team. Uh, believe it or not, I have been asked, and I'm like, not interested. First of all, there's like a thousand other people that that's all they seem to want to do, so go to them. I want to focus on empowered product teams. But I will also admit that there are two ways of turning insights into action. The command and control way, which generally turns into a roadmap, and the empowered team way. Now, this is going to yield, this is going to be a little bit of a complicated discussion here, let me start by pointing out that it is not hard to generate activity. We have no trouble doing that. In fact, that kind of is what makes it a big problem. And you know, I, I have to say, Agile only made this worse. It really did. And for the record, I always advocate the team should be delivering with some Agile process like Scrum or Kanban. But this is, uh, it made it worse because it made it even easier to crank out features faster than ever. It did, it did. So that was not the point, of course, but that is a consequence. The hard part is getting the right things done, the things that matter, you know, the things that have an impact and can really move the needle. Um, I don't know if you've seen this little video, Dan, Monty Python. I love this one. Have you seen this one? But, oh, thank you, that's right, we're gonna break everybody's eardrums again. This is, this is literally what I see in my mind when I see companies doing the normal roadmap process. We good? I swear that's what's going on with your roadmaps. I did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's exactly what's going on. It really is exactly what's going on. They are just going in every different direction. And you know, each one of those runners, if you got to call it that, are, um, are like serving some stakeholder on some part of the business. They're all like doing something, but if you look holistically, they're making no real impact. That is what's going on. So, what we need to do is we need to focus the minds, we need to focus the minds of the team, right, their energy into action. Um, and this is really what makes a difference. And this is, this is where, um, it's so clear the difference. Uh, what I really want to talk about, but I'll be honest, I'm a little hesitant to talk about it, is, um, is OKRs. <laughs> so I'm going to just jump in anyway. We'll see what happens. So uh, well, let me start by prefacing this. I do not recommend OKRs anymore. I used to recommend them all the time. I was a very vocal advocate. I do not recommend OKRs un unless they're already in the empowered product team model, which most companies are. The fundamental issue, well, most people know, and, and it's been plenty of years to give it a try. Most people know that OKRs in most companies is a big waste of time. Just a big waste. Most of them have pushed it off to the side and it's just OKR theater. They're, they're, and you know, it's easy to tell because they're given objectives and they're given roadmaps. It's like, so what do you think they're going to do? They're going to do the roadmaps. And so the, objective, the OKRs are really not. Now, what's going on here is OKRs came from the empowered product team company model. That's the, the companies that it came from. This was Intel. This was Google. This, they are around the model. If you take a company with feature teams and try to just overlay OKRs, you get the mess you see in companies. It makes no sense. I try to explain that um, 
You know, people think, and it's not hard to see why they all flock to OKRs. They're like, oh, Google uses it, Amazon, they're all making tons of money. It must be because they use OKRs. <laughs> That's really what they're thinking. So they're thinking, hey, OKRs are actually pretty simple. Come on, they are pretty simple, right? Here's an objective, here's some results, go for it. But what's going on is that uh, it's a true cultural mismatch. They are not successful, these good companies, because they use OKRs. They use OKRs because they go with the empowered team model that they've embraced. So the real issue is moving to the empowered team model. Now, if you've done that, that's what it's for. And I do advocate it for that situation, but I've really learned my lesson. You know, because I can talk about all these things you can do, and then they gravitate to OKRs because they're so easy conceptually, super easy conceptually, much harder than the kinds of changes I'm talking about, like <coughs> managers doing their jobs, <laughs> coaching, <laughs> investing in staffing. I mean, we could talk about all the things that good leaders are really supposed to be doing. It's a lot easier just to do OKRs. All right, so let's talk about this. For OKRs to be helpful and meaningful, there's three things that are really essential. The first is you've got to have empowered product teams, not feature teams. And if you're not ready yet to make that transformation, you know, save yourself a bunch of time. But that, and you know, that is a big change. Hopefully people know what I mean by that. If you haven't, if you don't, um, I would, plead with you actually to read an article. If you just Google uh, SVPG empowered team, feature team, something like that, it'll take you to this article. It, it's, happily, it was pretty popular. I've actually been writing about this stuff for years, but for whatever reason, I think I hit a chord with that one and people are like, okay, now I understand. And unfortunately, yes, we're a feature team. They understood that now. Uh, so you really need to look at that. It's a difficult transformation. I mean, this all the companies that are trying to do a digital transformation, they don't realize this, but what they really need to do and what they are if they want to succeed is convert from feature team to empowered product teams. But that is not a minor change. But for you, the good news is it actually requires these people called product managers. Uh, but of course, I'm not talking about the project manager product manager. I mean a real product manager. In fact, I, I, I used to, I'll be honest, you know, I, I have not been shy about using the term a good product manager is the CEO of the product, uh, but I would get a lot of frustration and confusion with that. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on. And then I realized it. They're talking about feature team product managers. A feature team product manager could not be further away from the concept of a CEO of a product. That's, that's so silly. It's like literally pointing to the project manager and saying, you're the CEO. Of the no, it's not even close. The CEO of the product concept comes from the empowered team model. That's where it comes from. Because like a CEO, if you think about a startup CEO, the designer is responsible for a usable solution and the engineers are responsible for a feasible solution. But that founder is responsible for making sure it's valuable, people will buy it, and viable. It works for a business. You can market it, you can sell it, you can make money from it, you can fund it. That's exactly, we lost one screen, um, but that's exactly what a real product manager is responsible for. So you, that's a big difference right now because if you think about it on a feature team, Nobody is explicitly responsible for value or viability. It's dispersed among the stakeholders. It's basically if some executive asks for something on the roadmap, they're taking responsibility for that. They don't necessarily realize that, but they are. If they say add this feature, they somehow believe that feature is valuable and that it's okay to do. In an empowered product team, they don't do that. They give them problems to solve and the product manager is responsible to make sure that solution is valuable and viable. So it's a, this is the real product manager job. Well, I should say this. In the industry I grew up with, and I'm comfortable saying this is the same true as Ben Horowitz and that we grew up in the same companies, 
This is what we mean by product manager. We do not mean project manager. We do not mean feature teams. Most of us would never have gone into this industry if that's what we thought our job was going to be. So, good news is I think as companies move to this, they realize, you know, they have designers and they have engineers, but they really need to invest in true product managers. <coughs> okay. Second thing they need is um, an, another thing that me messes up um, OKRs in companies is that each manager does their own set of OKRs. So like the director of engineering does a set, director design, director of product, and they, what do you think happens? They pass them down to their employees, right? And then on a product team, no, the product person probably thinks we're working on some company thing, but no. The designer says, no, I'm supposed to work on this because this is what my boss told me to work on. And the engineers are like, no, we have to work on this. So, of course, the whole OKR thing collapses under its own weight right there. Uh, and so I tell, look, the other thing you need to do is if you're going to embrace uh, emp empowered product teams and OKRs to be meaningful, stop doing that. It's just product teams that get objectives, just the product teams. So, um, and the other thing I say is, until you get good at this, stop doing individual OKRs. Those are just confusing the issue, and they're not important. Focus on the team. It's all about the product team. Just be clear, that doesn't, the product team is not the, the organization of product managers, right? This is a squad, a cross-functional, durable, <laughs> Hopefully co-located. That's another topic um, I need to uh, <laughs> spend more time on. Yeah, you know, the co-location, it is, I've been very vocal about the, the, ad, the benefits of co-location, but anybody who's followed anything knows it is not very politically correct to say that anymore. Uh, and I genuinely believe it is motivated by selfish Silicon Valley, mostly venture capitalists that want to, they, they know they can't afford people here, so they want to keep, they want to stay here, and anyway, I have, uh, I think it's BS, and I totally subscribe, and I'm going to share more of Amazon's philosophy on this, Netflix's philosophy on this, because they've taken a very hard stand for co-location. So you want to do that remote stuff, fine, but we're actually here to innovate. And I'm not kidding, it is a big difference. I'm not saying it's impossible with remote people, but boy, your odds go way down. And you know, everything I talk about is not, it's not a guarantee of success, but it's about increasing your likelihood of true innovation and success. And that is not helping you. And I scored a lot of points in the room with that, I know. <laughs> All right, so I don't care. <laughs> it's, I just, it's true. It's just true. So somebody, I think, needs to say it. All right. And the last one is active leaders, not passive leaders. So many people think, you know that little uh, Monty Python video, that's what I see people do with OKRs. They literally say, they go to the teams and say, pick your objectives, tell us your objectives. Go out, do your thing, we'll look at what's going on at the end of the quarter, and every team is going off on its own direction. I'm like, what are you doing? That is not what OKRs are about. The, the objectives actually need to come from the leaders. Now, not the key results, those come from the teams, but the objectives come from the leaders. That's how the strategy is turned into action. If the strategy is, look, we need these, your three teams, we need your teams to focus on this onboarding problem. We have got to fix that. It is not scalable. You guys need to focus on the onboarding problem. And between the three teams, there's enough brain power there. We think that's gonna, we're going to make a difference. That's where objectives come from. Now, those teams, they, you, what, what a empower or autonomy really means is they're able to figure out the best way to solve those problems. So we're not giving them a roadmap of features, we're giving them problems to solve. But they are not random problems. They are not problems left to teams to choose. Now don't get me wrong, one of the things we love 
is when the leaders share the strategy. They literally say the strategy, like we know onboarding's a problem, we know 80% of it is manual, whatever. They, they, these are the insights. We would like the teams to think about how they could help on this. We love it when teams go, hey, we would love to work on that problem because we think we have some really good ideas to pursue with that. We love it. But even if everybody came back and said they want to work on the same problem, we'd have to go to several of them and say, I, I'm sorry, we have other problems we have to solve too. So it's a responsibility of the leaders. And so I, again, I'm referring to this as active leaders. I don't want it to be confused with command and control leaders. These are not there to micromanage. In fact, uh, I'll talk about this next. I think it's really more like servant leadership that we're talking about. So, but these are the three things that have to be in place for a product company to really get value out of OKRs. And uh, if you don't have these three things, save yourself a bunch of time at the end of the quarter. All right. So the fourth part, if you remember, first was focus, then insights, then actions, and the fourth one is management. Now, the truth is no strategy survives first contact with the actual reality. So there will be a lot of learning. And the question is, what do you do? Now, in most companies, that's kind of the world, right? Roadmaps, because this is how Teams and organizations manage their work. This is nothing new. It's just a <laughs> screen grab of, it could be one of a million roadmaps out there. So there's nothing special about that other than it's terrible. <laughs> Look at it. It's all output. It's all output. That was the first one I grabbed. But they're all the same. They're output, a bunch of dates. It's, comp it's, this is not empowered product teams, just to be clear. This is what feature teams do. All right, so let's talk about strong product companies. The leaders have this servant leadership mindset. They are really there. Uh, what that really means is, okay, they've given the teams, servant leader does not mean passive or anything. It, that means they are, uh, they've given the team the objectives, but they know that things will come up. A team comes back and says, hey, we didn't realize we had a dependency on a platform team and we really need some help to get their help. This management is not just there to watch. They need to engage, go talk to the platform team. They might find out that, oh, there's a piece of technology we didn't realize we need. We need help with that. We need to get that technology in place. We need to expedite this. We need to make something happen. We have a stakeholder that's get, that's that needs some real attention, let's just say. And, and they need some help to kind of get with the program. So you need to the help there. On these good companies, the manager, it is a very hands-on, active role. The difference is they're not micromanaging. They're removing obstacles for the team. They're letting the teams come up with the right solution. They're just there to, to help facilitate. All right. Yes, this is that same point. Please, it's not about less management, it's about better management. All right. Okay, so, that went fast for me. Didn't have a lot of time. So, in terms of product strategy, summarize this. Critical to focus on the key critical business problems. Just realistically, two, three, the things that will really have a chance to move the needle. You know, this isn't really that hard. Most of the time I get, I mean, it's, it's hard politically. It's not hard to know what the right things are. Honestly, it's usually what's being talked about at the board of directors level. level. They, they, they know what the real levers are for the business. It might be unhappy customers. It might be growth. It might be... Uh, you know, a, a very common one in SaaS is uh, retention. Retention is if that number is not good, everything falls apart. They know. So it's not that hard to know the things that really matter. The problem is, in, you know, in most companies, you've got a lot of different stakeholders and executives, and they all have needs. Or at least, yeah, they do have real needs. I mean, they perceive right, you know, their perception of solutions and stuff, but they all have needs. And so it becomes more a process of trying to do a little bit for everybody. 
Back to the performance analysis problem. All right, second, generating insights on how to attack that problem, those problems. Now, this is where that culture comes in, where you really need a culture that is constantly learning from your customers, constantly learning from the data, constantly looking at new enabling technologies, constantly following the industry, so that you can prepare to identify the insights and then leverage them. Uh, there's one other point I should make about that. In every case I know that the leaders really are good and they are seeing these insights, it doesn't happen it doesn't happen on its own. They are always preparing. So they study the business. They study the dashboard. They understand the economics of the company. They understand the dynamics of the company. Like in a marketplace, they understand what we call marketplace health. They're looking at all dimensions of the marketplace. You know, at Amazon, it's not unusual for a typical leader to be, to be tracking several hundred KPIs every day. They are, they, we're not talking about just, they have a deep, big picture view of the business, which means when something really is spotted, they can see how that might be a great opportunity. They can see those. They're doing their, I, the way I phrase it is, they're doing their homework so that they're prepared to not miss that opportunity that comes in front of us. They come, the opportunities are always there. All right. You need to coordinate actions for each team. I didn't say this explicitly. Some people, this is another one of those weird, I don't know where the root is, but some people get really upset if, the same, if two different product teams are working on the same objective. They think that's somehow like, in, I don't know, inefficient or whatever. It's like, oh, no, that is really common. In fact, it's often really, really valuable. Now, there's different kinds of ways of working together. Sometimes, like, you're the platform team, I'm the, I'm the experience team, and we're working, you're going to do some new service for me. That's kind of obvious co cooperation. But another kind might be, um, it's a really hard problem. So we've each been asked to use our own technologies to solve that problem. And the truth is, and management is not hiding this, none of us may succeed. They're hoping at least one of us moves the needle. That's really called a risk management, risk mitigation technique. Another one, and this is actually one of my favorites, is if it's a really hard problem, it may totally be justified to take two or even three product teams and ask them to work together to solve it. Um, that's sometimes called a swarm, if you've ever heard of that, where they actually get together, they put the brains together, and they're, you know, the hopefully the combination of our experience and our skills, it's like, yeah, we can see. Now, we'll sometimes swarm on discovery, sometimes on delivery, sometimes on both. But that is, uh, yeah, that actually can be a lot of fun. You have to realize a lot of the problems we're asked to work on are, are really hard problems. They are not trivial problems. You're not being asked to add an edit button. <laughs> I say that, I literally, there was another article that came out on OKRs the other day, and his first example of a supposedly good OKR objective, add an edit button. <laughs> literally, that was the first one. I'm like, what is going on? There is so much nonsense out there. Totally, somebody totally missed the point of this stuff. Yeah. All right. And then finally, it takes active, engaged, capable managers to, uh, to manage this work and facilitate the interactions that need to happen. Uh, it's especially, this is, this is more and more true the larger the organization. Management needs to connect the dots. The head of design, hopefully that's obvious. They need to connect the dots. It needs to be one experience. The head of engineering needs to connect the dots. You need a, an architecture that makes sense holistically, a tech debt strategy. Tech debt, by the way, is a classic <laughs> example of what we've been talking about. You can't tackle tech debt effectively with every team doing a little bit. It doesn't work. That's the little refactor frequently. That, they will never do the magnitude changes that are needed to really address the issues. All right, so um, those are the four big things. Let me try to put all this into perspective, just so that you hopefully have a frame of reference here. The product vision is really describing 
the destination. I didn't talk much about vision. I've talked about that a lot. I love product vision. It's very inspiring. It helps us recruit great people. But that's not this. That's sort of a given. We, uh, and it's sort of the input to strategy. That's where we're trying to go. Product strategy helps us decide which problems we need to solve to make that happen. That's absolutely, I would argue that's the most important part. Product discovery is actually where we figure out the tactics. And just to be clear, roadmaps are tactics. That, that's what I said, it just skips strategy. They're going straight from double revenue to a bunch of tactics. There is no strategy. Strategy leads to a bunch of problems to solve. Each of those are solved by the team in discovery. Discovery is just trying to find a solution that works. At the end of the day, they will probably build out some features, but they're building the ones that they actually have verified solved the problem. For those that don't know, that means the solution is valuable, it's usable, it's feasible, and it's viable. All right, and finally, delivery builds that solution. That's the one most people understand. But those are the four, that's sort of how the four main concepts in product really relate. <sighs> okay. I referenced a couple books. I've, I've tried to, you know, I've been a student actually of product strategy my whole career. Um, I admit I like discovery best, because to me that's just fun. Uh, literally, solving hard problems, prototyping, tests, that's just fun. Uh, however, I would say that the strategy skills are more valuable, at least for me, career-wise, has been even more valuable. Because um, the strategy, if the strategy's not good, it's kind of the rest don't ma doesn't matter. So even though I love discovery so much, I would argue that this, the investments in strategy have really helped. So anyway, I've been a student and reading books forever. I've found two that I think are good and useful. Most of them fit into that category of the paint by numbers thing. You know, do this and you'll come up with something. Uh, I love the good strategy, bad strategy, and the art of action. To be honest, this guy writes military history books, but it turned, you know, the truth is military strategy is it's a lot of similarities with product strategy. And he seemed to figure that out and he decided to write a book on that and it's, a, it's one of the best ones out there if you haven't heard of it. He doesn't actually even reference OKRs, but he's really talking about OKRs. Uh, yeah. I don't even know though he knows they exist, to be honest. And I, ch I checked the date. It, it's not like it was, he wrote it when OKRs were big. And I was sort of surprised about that, but I'm like, he's describing the way OKRs are supposed to be used. And I literally did a, got the Kindle version, searched, nothing. <laughs> so. Okay, so there's, uh, for those that don't know, um, the second edition of the book is 100% rewrite from the first edition. So if you, even if you did read the first one, I hope you do read the second one. And if you like that topic discovery, I definitely hope you read it. Uh, like we said, I am in the middle of um, writing a new book, which is called Empowered um, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Products. That's one point I didn't really get across, but I probably should share with you. I told you the four companies that really impact, you know, and motivated me on this and impacted my thinking. One of the things that, uh, one of the things I think most people, when I, the biggest argument I get against empowering teams from CEOs is they think they can't hire the caliber people that Google hires. And I try to set them straight that, uh, that Google's people are much more like their people than they think. And I tell them one way I know that for a fact is for the so many people that I have introduced into these companies. And they tell me after six months that they have done more in those six months than they had done in their previous several years. Then these are the same brains, same bodies, same people. The difference is they finally left, landed in an environment that would let them do work. So I am absolutely you know, convinced that What's special about the four companies I talked about is how they let their teams do their jobs, not that it's some sort of uh, DNA, you know, filtering or something going on. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, so do we have time for questions, yeah, Dan? Yeah, so let's give Marty a round of applause. All right. We want to capture it so it gets on the video. So you have to have a mic to ask a question. Just raise your hand. We have mic runners that will get a mic to you and just wait your turn. There you go. Go for it, Tim. Um, thanks again, Marty. It's awesome. Um, you mentioned the military influence. Someone told me the other day about something called commander's intent. If you command know, intent. It's command, command intent. I use the. T yeah. Uh, everybody, well, you don't have to repeat the question with the microphone. So, uh, command intent, I use the term strategic co context for that. Uh, and it's a really important point. It's not in this particular uh, talk, but it is an important point on the empowered team concept. And you know why? If, look, imagine you're, a, you know, they call them squads in the military. But remember, imagine you're a SEAL squad. If you were, a, if it was command and control, and you were trying to do something, like capture something, and you literally had to follow some recipe, you're, you're dead, literally. The way that they are true examples of empowered team. They are given an objective, and they're given skills. And by the way, these squads are by design cross-functional. They have different skill sets in there, medical, long distance shooting, uh, demolitions, all these different skills. And uh, they have to be able to make decisions themselves and figure out the best way to do it. Now that works if you do two things. You give them uh, a mission, the objective, by the way, in the OKR. You give them an objective. And two, you've got to give them the big picture. They need to know how their work relates to all the other squads that are out there and what the overall objective is. That's called command intent. I use the term strategic context. The product strategy is part of the strategic context, as is the product vision, as is the business objectives, um, and also the other big one is the product principles. So yeah, it's a really important concept that applies in our world too. I considered using some of the military terminology, but uh, it's, it's got some baggage. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Hey Marty. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. I had a question as a manager of a product team, and I think something I really struggle with is we, have, we own a really large product, and it's really hard to help people focus when you're getting inundated by so many questions about really large, historical, old products. So I was wondering, tactics or advice you have for how do you filter out some of that noise from the team, but also we have to adequately own the product that we own today. So I don't know, just ideas on how we could better manage that. What you're saying though is you've got a product, a big product, and you're getting a lot of questions about that product. And you're the product manager? I'm a manager of a team of product managers. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. Well, of course, everybody else in the room is probably thinking that's normal. Right? They, we all get tons of questions and tons of feedback. We have customer service. We have sales. We have customers. We've got questions coming from finance. We've got a lot of that. And of course, if, um, if it's bugs and you know, you're start to the point where you, the teams are telling you that just the cost to, it's often referred to as keep the lights on, is, over, is basically consuming their teams. You might be saying that. Uh, that. That definitely happens in companies. And they're like, we can't make any forward progress. We are just treading water, barely. And it's not very motivating. If that's what's going on, then you know the company has, you're in a serious, and it may even be tech debt on to even be causing that or a big, big part of that. So this is not something that's easy to change, but the company is going to have to make some hard choices. I would argue, the focus probably hasn't been happening, and now it's non-negotiable. It has to happen. And boy, it's uh, high stakes to do that. So I don't want to be too, um, you know, there's a lot of potential things that could be causing these symptoms. So it's uh, without sort of going into a whole back and forth of how many engineers do you have and how many designers and where are all the inputs coming from and stuff like that. But as a principle, though, I, don't, I want to say just one other thing, which is you do want the product managers that work for you to be getting the feedback directly. We do not like filters. So one reaction to that would, might be shut things down, you know, so that they don't have so much noise coming in. But it's really essential that the product manager hear all feedback. Yeah. 
Sure. Hey, Marty, thanks for a great talk. Uh, can you talk about the product strategy for early stage teams, like a team of three people working on the first MVP, and uh, how do you see strategy there when the resources are low and you're still trying to get the first version out? Okay, well, the first thing I would say is that strategy is not like a luxury for when you have big organizations. Strategy is about making much better use of the limited resources you have. Most startups, you know, there is this, I don't know, the truth is I meet a lot of startups, some of them, it's like, how did they get any funding? They don't, <laughs> like, I don't know. So I don't want to say, so some startups are great and some of them are not. Uh, you know that. But, um, but uh, I would argue a strategy is all about smart use of resources. In fact, we can take this back to that Pandora example. I mean, I, I already said I think it was insane for them to try to go public in that space with only 40 engineers. And I would have, if I was on the board, I would have raised hell about that. It's just crazy. And I think they ultimately paid the price of that, for sure. But uh, if there was just 40 engineers, then they literally had the worst possible process. Because you could argue that with only 40, if you don't have a super smart strategy and you don't pick really well, you're toast. So strategy is a way, to, it's, a, it's a force multiplier, right? It's not a luxury. So, so just as a follow-up, you mean strategy as a kind of process, not as an uh, outcome or a document or something documented which you really present to your team? Oh, maybe we should talk privately. <laughs> yeah, because uh, there, there's a lot there we need to unpack. Yeah, but strategy is not a process, to be clear. It's not a process. It's insights that turn into action. And you can document it if you want. Who cares? But it, what really matters is you've got to make sure your team understands it. But let me just say, if in the scenario you described, startup, working, early stages, trying to get to product market fit, you better be good at the stuff we're talking about. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so how do you keep everyone happy and still be focused at the same time? Um, no, I love that question. How do you keep everybody happy? Well, that's a super easy to answer. You don't. No, I don't think it's possible. I mean, you can keep them happy at least until, you know, the stock drops through the floor. <laughs> Um, but no, yeah, this is not, it, I think this idea of keeping everyone happy is fundamental. Look, that's why the CEO doesn't want to focus. And you know, it's not just like they're trying to please people. It's fear of missing out. They're like, oh, all these things could be important. So let's, we, let's do them all. <laughs> I mean, it sounds safer, but no, it's really not. And it's, um, yeah, we, product people have to make these trade-offs every single day. It is really important. Now, I do believe in not being a jerk about it. Because some product people are. They're like, because I said so. You know, it's that kind of thing. No, I believe in full transparency, being very open with the stakeholders, really showing them the strategy, showing them the insights, showing them the reasoning. In fact, I'm a huge fan of the, the written narrative to really spell, like for stakeholders to see why you decided to do something is like all out here. Take a look, you know, the CEO's read it, everybody's read it, make sure you understand I'm not trying to be arbitrary here or capricious, this is, so, but the, the goal of keeping everybody happy is not, I think, a realistic goal. How about keeping everybody employed? <laughs> So, uh, there was, yeah, go ahead. I have a question here. Uh, I've got a background in sales and I've been considering making a move into product. <coughs> what would you recommend to somebody in my shoes and what do you think I should be mindful of? Can you say, I just, there was just a, some, say the middle part again, I'm sorry. Oh, um, I was saying that I'm considering making a move from sales to product management. Okay. So what would you recommend to somebody like me in these shoes considering that move and what should I be mindful about? Oh, right. Um, moving from sales to product. 
Um, I definitely know some people that have moved from sales to product because, you know, in sales you've got that frontline experience with customers. The truth is every single person that moves from product to product has some gaps and some strengths. There's a tool that I published as part of this coaching series uh, and, and I would strongly encourage you to self-assess. Just self-assess. I mean, I, as a, with your background, there's some things I'm pretty sure you're going to do pretty well in, but there's going to be a lot of areas that, that you, at least from just your sales experience, you haven't said anything about education or other jobs, you would not have been exposed to. So you will probably have a pretty substantial set of things to develop, and you can get to work on those things. Um, uh, in my experience, most people that really want to get to product can, but they have to do the work. There's a, and there can be a lot of work. It is definitely not an easy job. Unless you go to a feature team and it's pretty easy. <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, yeah. Indrajit here. I'm a product manager at Springboard. And I think we're in the middle of this transition from being a feature team to hopefully an empowered product team. Uh, but building on the question of how do you keep stakeholders happy, uh, how do you say no to them when they come to you and when they've been trained to come to you with feature requests every quarter for planning? And especially when you're asked to defend and compare and contrast their requests against like everything you have planned and... I understand all too well. I mean, you're describing feature teams, exactly, just to be clear, so you're not alone. For sure, but the, the question you're really asking is how do you transform your organization to a modern tech-powered product organization? And that is not a three-minute question. <laughs> that is a major topic, but I guess I could say I'm writing a book about it. <laughs> What's there on? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm an engineer. I work in engineering, uh, I'm a manager, uh, but uh, I work for a big company and a lot of engineers see obvious things, you know, but everyone is afraid to tell, you know, the managers, uh, well, this is getting proof, you know, and uh, empowerment of the teams is something that we lack. Actually, we're like three steps before. I mean, we're not even, we're not even into the future uh, teams. Uh, You're not using safe, are yeah. you? So, I mean, there are two things, uh, and they are, I, I, I believe <laughs> they're aligned to the same thing. Fear. Fear of, of the people telling up, you know, uh, this is wrong or this can be improved. And fear of the people of, to make, I mean, to change things. Yeah. How do you, do you deal with yeah. fear? Well, I mean, the, this is, um, you're not just talking about, like, the, like you said, the difference between feature teams and empowered teams. You're talking about a cultural change in a company. I mean, the kind of company you're describing, um, you know, is not the kind of place most people want to work. Um, the uh, fear is not a good thing. You know that. Uh, and, and I will say there's a great, great, the people have heard me talk before know I'm just a huge fan of Bill Campbell, Coach Bill Campbell. He died a couple of years ago, but he was considered the best coach ever. Um, he actually was CEO here at uh, Intuit for a few years. Um, I just remembered that. But uh, just an awesome guy. And anyway, he's, I have all these great quotes from him. And um, one of my favorites was, there is nothing more powerful than an empowered engineer. And I really believe that's true. Because if you, I do get to work with a lot of cool product teams and inevitably, the real innovations come from the engineers. And I always encourage good engineers to work at a place that can use their skills. So, I mean, if you, hopefully you can convince your management that they should use your skills, but if not, you should definitely, there are lots of companies in this valley that <laughs> love to use engineers and let them do, like Steve Jobs used to say, we don't hire all these people to tell them what to do, we hire them to show us what's possible. So, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. How are you? Good. 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 Good
Uh, I have a question about when you're saying aligning different teams to go towards one objective or towards one goal. Yes. Um, I think kind of like in the realities of my day to day uh, work is that I feel different teams have different goals. You know, let's say, for example, the onboarding team wants to get people to the onboarding flow faster, the yeah. tech team wants to get people to check out faster. Um, and then, you know, at the company level or the org, like, org level, you'll have goals like, okay, let's make the company happier or let's increase revenue. But I think that is too high level for me to be able to tie everything together. And so I'm kind of wondering, you know, how do we get there to where, you know, people can see we're heading to some direction and what level of, you know, kind of like height is feasible yeah. and also good. Well, first of all, the good part of what you said is their goals. Right? You didn't sort of rattle off a bunch of features on a roadmap. You talked about goals. That's good. You talked about some high level company goals. You talked about some team specific goals. The only part that was missing was product strategy. And so I would argue your good example, now there might be one, but you don't, didn't share that in there because that's the missing part. That was the underpants gnome. You know, you have the big goals, you have the profit at the end, but it's that middle part. So that's what I would encourage you to work on, is that clear articulation of a strategy, which will then, of course, cause you to revise your team goals. And again, they don't all have to be the same goal. It's normal in a larger organization to be pursuing each team pursuing different problems. Sometimes the same problems, but lots of different problems. But they all need to be aligned. One of the virtues of OKRs is it's a lot easier to align our organization, make sure we're going in the same direction. But that doesn't mean like we're only working on, what's one you said, onboarding or, you know, checkout. Um, do you have an example so that you can like kind of bring it together for me of like how that would fit together? Well, um, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the presentation. <laughs> um, I, I am, but I understand where you're coming from. And in fact, I, one of the parts of the book I'm writing on right now is a very detailed case study because I want people to not just think it's theory, but also see how it all plays out. So it's got the actual team topology, it's got their actual strategy, their actual objectives. And so hopefully to be able to answer that question. But um, I'm also writing a bunch of articles about to publish more that I think will give you more to work with. But it's a big topic. There was, uh, yes, over here, hi. Yeah, so the, thank you so much for for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I actually just read this one book uh, of yours. Um, Good. I actually am currently working in finance, and I'm considering making a shift into product management. Good. Uh, I'm in the process of completing a certificate of the mail that, that's going to lie with the book, so I read it. So what are some of the areas of focus you think I should be looking into as far as like, different areas of field? <laughs> Uh, so partly it's a sim similar answer to the person who's coming from sales. Obviously finance and sales are not the same, but you will have very different, um, you know, you'll have similar uh, profile of things that you need to work on. Um, there, there is one other thing though I'd like to mention that applies to the salesperson as well. Don't worry so much about what company you go work for. Because even, even if you go to Amazon, which is, I mean, they are really good at what we're talking about. They also have a demanding culture, which isn't for everybody, so you kind of have to know that. But they're really good about what we're talking about. That said, I know teams there that are feature teams. So even in great companies, some teams are, you know, usually because they haven't earned the trust yet of the leaders. But the point is, what matters more than the company you go work for is the person you're going to work for literally the person, especially if it's your first job in product. You want to find somebody, there's really two things I tell people to look for. Look at their, look on LinkedIn, see where they've worked before. If they've worked at a good product company that, where they know how to do this well, that's number one. Number two, during the interview, you want to say, look, I'm coming here to learn from you. And I, am willing to work very hard, I want to know if you're willing to coach me to become great. Some people, well most people will be flattered, they love to hear that. Some people will say, I have no time, I need people ready to hit the ground running. 
But what really matters is for you to find someone who's willing to invest in you. Um, and it's, to be honest, it's usually a year or two of work, of developing in this situation. If you're brand new to product, before you really at that level you really want to be and can go, go on. So it, much more important than the company is the manager. You've probably all heard that line too. It's, it's so true, but people join a company but they leave their manager. Uh, that is really true. So uh, don't get me wrong, if you can go work for Netflix, awesome. But if you can't, getting somebody who used to work at Netflix, like a product director at Netflix, and now is willing to, they're at another company, a smaller startup, and they're looking for somebody like you, that's great. Yeah, hi. Hi, Madi. Uh, I am a big fan of your book, and it really helped me start my initial career in products. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I just want to touch on a subject uh, called decisiveness. Uh, do you think uh, a good product manager is needs to be always be decisive and always like have quick, you know, like decisions like on, on tip of their hands uh, when there are situations when you have to decide, or is it okay to like? step back and take your time to figure out what the decisions should be? Or does that have a negative impact overall on the team and the dynamics? No, there's probably a little story behind your question there too, yeah. I'm thinking. <laughs> but um, to, to be clear, you know, we all know those product manager types that feel like they just have to know everything or they have to sort of appear like they know everything. I've never seen this work. I, I think it backfires. Um, so. You know, making decisions is one of the most important thing we do. However, uh, they should be, you know, the decision has to be proportional to the consequence. There's a lot of minor things which, frankly, don't even need to be decisions. You probably could defer to your designer, defer to your engineer. It's just like, fine. Uh, on the big things, if you try to make a, like a right away decision, you're doing a disservice to everybody, starting with you. So I did write about how a big topic of coaching, for me with coaching product people, is coaching them on how to make good decisions. I already shared some parts about like being transparent, but you know you also have to bring along the rest of the company, you have to bring along your stakeholders, your teammates. So there's a, this is not a minor topic. The most important thing though is, uh, my boss Mark Andreessen used to drill this in, Know what you can't know, admit what you don't know. Just really important, don't pretend. Um, and people, I think, respect that. Now, of course, if I don't know something, I say it, but I make a point to go find it out. You know, so I'll go back and say, okay, I looked into that, or we ran a test, or whatever we did, but here. Because the, they deserve an answer, but they, won't, you know, they deserve a good answer. So it's okay to take time. It should take time. Yeah. And the only other thing I'd say is don't make a decision if you don't need to. If you can just defer to your colleagues that are the experts in it, that is much better. We hate those product managers that are always trying to play, uh, you know, boss. They're not really the boss of anybody, right? The product manager. Was there a question? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm a huge fan. I actually started a book club, and yours is the first book. Oh, I'm cool. Read, so I'm really excited to be here right now. Um, so I'm actually a product designer, and um, right now I'm having an issue of uh, my PM not being empathetic towards our users. What can I do to make them be more empathetic? <laughs> 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 no, it's a super good question. Um, by the way, everybody heard it, uh, but it's also really common, a lot of times product managers will ask me that question about how can they get their engineers to really respond, you know, understand the pain our users are really in. Uh, and I actually am a big fan, I think it's the same answer for both. You need to bring them out to users and customers, face to face, no messing around with intermediaries, face to face. And it is, I think it's magical, actually. Um, it is very motivating, especially for the engineers. Um, and that, you know, it's hard not to be empathetic when you really know someone. It's really easy, unfortunately, especially for consumer products. This is a bigger problem in the consumer space than the B2B, interestingly. 
in consumer, you know, and you got millions of users, like uh, the millions of users, it's abstract, it's like whatever, I'm never gonna make them all happy. So, but you know, you really have to get that, once you've got names and faces and you really know them, <coughs> But it also makes, it makes all of product more f satisfying, more meaningful. Uh, one of the, you didn't ask this very end of the question, but one of the challenges is, you know, we're not all working on something like uh, Google Maps, which is like everybody is like, I can relate to Google Maps, it's awesome, or Google Photos, something like that. We're not all working on, a lot of the stuff is like, oh, I'm doing payroll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I picked that on purpose. Come on. I know where I am. But we're doing payroll. It's like, it's not like Twitter, right? It's not like I, I'm telling grandma about it that way. So, but I have found that when you take your product manager, when you take your engineers to the payroll departments of these customers and literally sit down with them, or even better, like invite them to dinner with you that night when you visit that. It's a whole different thing. I mean, honestly, I have seen this so many times. It's happened to me so many times. They actually tell you, for example, what happens under stress on payroll runs. And what happens when there's a problem. Or what happens when you know, you've got somebody yelling at you for uh, getting this done by a certain time, or there aren't funds in the bank to cover this, and you've got to now talk to finance, and it's just, it's, they realize that, oh my gosh, these people have super hard jobs, and uh, you know what, I think we could make it better for them. So I've found that works. And I want to go further, especially with developers. Developers are, I mean, obviously I'm biased on this, but I, they really want to help people. They really do. And I think that one of the biggest crimes in our industry is when we shelter developers. A lot of developers, the only way they feel like they can help people is by helping their colleagues by writing tools. So they love doing tools. And some people think that's all we developers want to do is innovate by doing tools. No, it's just that they know their developers that they work with. If you introduce them to these payroll clerks and managers, they are going to care about them too. I mean, I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi, Marty. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sid, and thank you again, because I started my product management career thanks to your book as well. Right. It's been a while, but I did start with that. Um, I had a question about focus. Uh, there's a flip side to focus, right? Because Focus also means that you're putting your eggs in one basket. Well, or a small number of them, yes. A small number of them. Now that's okay for Google, right? Because they have, they have a lot of engineers, they can do a lot of things. Uh, but for a smaller company, you know, 100, 200 people, maybe 500 people, you can put, you can have maybe two, three bets. That's all, right? These are, these are your bets for a year, if you want to go for big bets. Just to be clear, you're making my argument. <laughs> you are. Google, it doesn't matter. They have more money than God from AdWords. <laughs> they do. So they can, and they do spend, you know, they, nobody can even count how many things they're working on. Sure, but the bets but if it's, the bets could go wrong, they right? do, most of them. They do, and that's fine, because they have AdWords. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying for a smaller company. I, you're making, I'm just trying to point out you're making my point. In a smaller company, you can't mess around like that. In a smaller company, you have not nearly, you don't have a thousandth of the resources they do. So you know what, you better make good use of the people you have. That's the point of strategy, is you have to make sure you are doing good use. And what I was trying to say is, if you just say, well, we're not sure, we're gonna make 20 bets, and we have 30 engineers, so we'll just do a little. This is the fear of missing out, you know, we're just gonna, I, all I'm saying is that's a guarantee you're gonna fail. So would you argue that maybe Pandora made like one bet, and that bet was the music genome, right? That was their bet. And they said, this is what we're going for. We have 40 engineers. Who cares? I have like manual people working on this music thing, and that's my product. I'm going to go after this. And they failed at it, right? That could be an argument. That I would argue they didn't. I mean, they, they really didn't make any conscious bets, right? They abdicated that responsibility by just giving it to the stakeholders. That's what I meant by absence of product. 
I would have argued, you know, and I, it's all, I wasn't there, but you know, and it's all hindsight, but I would have argued to them, I hope I would have known to say this, that they are a tech-powered music company. You know, at the time, it was all about their deals with the studios, and they were dominated by expensive costs. That's why they said they couldn't have more than 40 developers, because all their money went to pay for rights. Mm -hmm. And I would have argued, look, you are in a tech-powered business. You have to have a machine for continuous innovation. And if you don't, it's only a matter of time. They did have a head start, and they lost it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I would argue that even no guarantee with only 40 engineers, even with the best strategy in the world, it's not clear. But my, it would have been a much better shot than just random, let's see what everybody, a little bit for everybody. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hey, Marty. Yes. I'm over here. Okay. I'm Ariana. I actually, I'm a product manager on Google Maps. <laughs> We actually do still meet users uh, as frequently as possible because it's just so enlightening and humbling. Yeah. Um, but my question is more about, I love your framework, and the point in that framework that I'm most interested in unpacking is the management part. Uh -huh. And um, you know, the two things were servant leadership and better management, not less management. But I'd love to hear you demystify what management means and what does product management, people management really mean. Oh, yeah. And if you have like a framework for what good management is. I know there's Trillion Dollar Coach, but I'd love to hear Marty's. Well, yeah. I would like to think that anything I say is consistent with Trillion Dollar Coach, but this is more, um, yeah, and I wouldn't frame what I, ha you know, what I argue as a framework, because I don't know if it deserves that level. It's more, there are responsibilities of managers that are absolutely critical, I think. Because we're now talking about, just to be clear, first level managers of product managers? Correct. Okay, good. This is what I consider the most important role for really making all this stuff happen. So this is the one I like to talk about. So number one is staffing. Staffing. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of these things are an hour talk in their own right. So I don't want to do too much of a disservice. But staffing is huge. The main thing I'd say is good managers of product managers do not depend on HR. HR is a sourcing model, but good managers are using the recruiting model. What that means is you are going to events like this, and you are getting to know people, and you are building a network of a pipeline of people that you think are right for your team. That's really important. And then, um, and I, I've worked for years to get the right people. You know, where you build trust and you build, and you know, waiting for the right point in their career, and but. Uh, the point is you go recruit them. You do not just look at resumes that are coming through HR. Second is coaching. The biggest responsibility I would argue you have as uh, a manager of product managers is to coach and develop your product managers. And of course, actually, Google has a good history with that. And I hope, uh, and uh, many of the people I have sent over there have told me how it's real. It's like they benefited. But active coaching, helping people reach their potential. Um, and then the third is this point with the team objectives. To really, because you as that first level manager, you're really the one converting the strategy into objectives. So you're in the best position to see what each team should really is best positioned to do. And you know, you're right in the middle of that negotiation between what you need them to do, what they think they could do, what is necessary to be done. So we're looking at, that's, those are the three fundamental responsibilities of managers. It's also true that some managers are leaders of the organization. Uh, and those people have even more responsibilities. Now we're talking product vision, we're actually talking this product strategy, we're talking product principles, and a big evangelism responsibility, which is really back to Tom was asking uh, about with the uh, strategic context. Yes, and if you're interested, I did write an article called Empowered Product Teams that talks about the responsibilities of managers. And that's really been a big focus of mine. I want to, I want to, I benefited from really good management. And I realize most people have not had that. So I want to see a lot more people get it. All right, thanks a lot, Marty. Let's give Marty a All right, thank you. Thank you.